Hello, Harry Lightfoot here and welcome to my Q&A session. So the guys from Audio Machine got in touch with me about two or three weeks ago to ask if I would be interested in doing this and, and answering some of your questions. And I was understandably a little nervous about doing it, largely because I didn't want there to be this sort of colossal tumbleweed moment. But in fact, what has happened is we've had so many people get in touch with questions and really, really kind comments. So thank you so much for taking the time to get in touch. Uh, I'm gonna try and get through uh, as many as I possibly can Please bear with me if I uh, tend to stutter or stumble or uh, just drone on. Uh, I will uh, I will try and be as concise as I can. So here we go. The answer, like a lot of these things, is it depends. Sometimes I can come in and uh, I can complete a piece of music uh, in a day uh, from start to finish, um, fully produced and mixed, um, and sometimes a piece of music of the same length uh, can take weeks um, and I don't know, I haven't mastered what it is yet about that. Um, I, if I could write every track in a day, believe me I would, um, I don't know why sometimes uh, they become a real labour of love and uh, yeah they can go on for days and days and days. So yeah on the whole maybe I, I try and set aside two or three days to get a track uh, fully completed. I think uh, for me as a composer, I, I tend to have a starting point, which is usually an instrument, a sound of some sort, and then that usually um, starts me off, and then I, I, I go off on one. Just you know, I get inspired purely by the sound of one note on a piano or one note on a guitar, or I might load up some soft synths, uh, and it's usually that that's the kind of spark. That, that sets me off uh, on, on writing and I never I never sort of set out when I'm writing a piece of music I never um, I, I never know quite where it's going to go I don't have a solid structure I kind of go with it um, and uh, yeah so I'm afraid it's not a, a solid answer there but hopefully um, you know it gives you a bit of an insight into uh, into what I do I usually by the way I usually start writing uh, I'm pointing at my piano by the way uh, just so you don't think I'm pointing into thin air uh, I usually start on my piano over there and I find if I can build up some really really simple melodic uh, ideas on the piano it usually translates quite well to when I, I come to produce it on uh, on logic here That's a difficult one. Uh, I would probably say that um, No Retreat, No Surrender from Worlds of Wonder. Um, I, I, you know, that was a really fun one to work on and fortunately for me it got used in the, in the Star Wars Rogue One campaign and a couple of other smaller campaigns. Um, and then there's another one from Worlds of Wonder called Be Careful What You Wish For. I think that was one of my favourites because it doesn't sort of take itself too seriously. It's fun, it makes you smile um, and it's just been used in the Smallfoot trailer as well as uh, the Lemony Snicket's uh, trailers on Netflix. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with those. Unlike a lot of composers that you might see online when you see their studios where they've got wall-to-wall -wall rack mounted synths and, and, and colossal amounts of hardware and, and bits and bobs, I, you know, my, my setup is, is a lot more modest so this shouldn't take very long um, and I guess the best way to show you is with my phone so I'm sorry if it's the, the camera works a bit shoddy but here we go. Here we go then, so this is my main room, there you go, have a quick scan around. Um, I'm going to give you a quick run through then of just a few key uh, bits of gear that I've got um, and as I say it shouldn't take long because I don't have uh, an awful lot of gear really, it's mainly uh, a lot of stuff that I have is in the box so uh, yeah this will be very quick. Here we go then, so starting with my interface here which is the Universal Audio Apollo uh, Firewire interface because I'm still on uh, a Mac 5.1 so no Thunderbolt connections yet so that's why I've got this Firewire interface. Um, then we've got this uh, Focusrite, it's called the Producer Pack, the ISA430. It's a kind of all-in-one channel strip and it sounds absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and I tend to actually only use the uh, preamp section here and the compression there. Uh, the rest of it stays pretty dry. 
Um, and then going down, I've got a couple more preamps here, which is the Heritage Audio D uh, DMA 73, um, which uh, I run my piano mics and my room mics through, and they stay permanently connected. Um, so there we go, that's pretty much all I've got there. I've got this lovely um, Matrix Brute synth from Arturia that just sounds absolutely phenomenal. Uh, love it, really, really nice. Um, then we've got uh, the uh, Mackie Control Universal, complete with uh, Broken Fader on, on Channel 3. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it, really. So, uh, oh yeah, I should say that these uh, speakers, actually, I really like. Um, they're quite affordable, but they're, um, yeah, I've just, I, I really like them. They're the JBL uh, LSR series. Um, yeah, so totally recommend them. And then, uh, what studio isn't complete without some uh, Yamaha NS10s, uh, bought from eBay. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. A few guitars over here and here. Um, I'm also the world's worst guitarist, but uh, you know, I, it's fine, I get by. Um, and then my piano, which is my pride and joy. Uh, and actually you can hear on quite a few of the tracks that we've done for Audio Machine. Um, the opening track of Life, um, Promises to Keep, you can hear that. Uh, that's the, uh, the this piano uh, all over it. So if you wanted to hear how that sounds, go and have a listen. There we go. Kamal, this is a, a, a really important question um, because, uh, and it's the thing that I think sets Audio Machine apart from everyone else in that their sort of default position with this is to get everything recorded live. They want these albums to sound uh, as big and as expressive and as human as possible. And so re by recording your strings and your brass, your choirs, and sometimes even um, your percussion section as well, um, all live. It just adds such a lovely human quality to it that you just cannot get with samples. The, the sample libraries are stunningly impressive these days and you can really do everything just on these keys here. Um, but uh, in simply by adding in a, a live section, string section say, um, it really does add a bit of magic that you just don't get with samples. Um, so I'm pleased to say that Audio Machine, most of it is recorded live. Obviously synths and all that kind of stuff and some percussion is, is uh, mainly in the box, um, but yeah, on the whole, we, we try and record as much of it as live as possible, um, and especially that's been the case with Life and been the case with Worlds of Wonder and a lot of previous albums to that, um, and which is why, of course, they sound as good as they do. So it was recorded in Prague um, and we weren't there live, it was all done remotely because uh, essentially life has um, uh, quite a few different composers from all over the world so the easiest thing was for it to just be a remote session. So uh, Kevin Ricks was uh, I believe in charge of this session um, from his studio in LA, he was overseeing it and I think he was up at sort of two or three in the morning trying to uh, to, to get this all done, which would have been pretty tough, uh, but actually the end result is, is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, couldn't be happier. The answer is yes, it will be released. Uh, in 2018, there will be a new album coming out um, of a kind of uh, smaller ensemble style tracks for trailers. And uh, yeah, it's a completely different approach really uh, and it's a lot of fun to write and uh, yeah and so I'm thrilled that you've, you've already had a chance to hear a little bit of that track um, and it was used in that uh, Volvo Music of the Mind trailer um, and so yeah you can expect it in 2018. Uh, I'm very, very fortunate to say that I, I, I know quite a, a few vocalists, but I have a couple that I tend to use more um, because they are absolutely phenomenal. Firstly, there's a, a great singer called Valerie Vett, who uh, I've used on on a lot of the tracks from Worlds of Wonder. You might have heard her singing on No Retreat, No Surrender. Uh, and Take Flight uh, and a couple of others. And the other singer that I tend to use quite a lot is Natalie Palmer, who is a fantastic session vocalist uh, from London. Uh, she will come up on the train to my studio here in Leamington Spa and we tend to uh, record quite a lot together. Uh, she's fantastic. So uh, yeah, you can hear her singing on Goddess of Light uh, from That's On Life. 
uh, and a few other tracks um, and we've got a few more things coming up uh, as well in the new year so uh, yeah keep your eyes peeled for that Now that's such a massive question. So rather than focusing on the uh, nitty gritty part of uh, actually writing tracks, I think uh, I would like to focus, if I may, on the, the whole process from me starting here, um, writing tracks uh, with my system here, to creating this finished uh, product, which you then hear on iTunes, Spotify, etc. Essentially, the process is, is I will, uh, using Logic Pro as my secret, so I will, um, um, create um, the track as with with all my sample instruments the brass the strings everything um, on here and then I will send it off to um, to the guys at audio machine now usually what happens is is uh, there is a team of, of um, music supervisors uh, especially Tom Mora Kevin they will uh, one or all of them will get in touch with me um, with feedback to the track Hopefully it's good feedback, sometimes it's not so good feedback and I will then take another pass at some of uh, the track, um, you know, depending on what they've said. In almost all cases their feedback is we want it bigger, we want it punchier. We will then take another pass at it and with, with their feedback and maybe it might mean taking a section out and maybe restructuring the, the track. And so there is quite a little bit of toing and froing. Um, and uh, so until we end up with our sort of final track. At that point, we will then look to get elements recorded, if not the whole thing recorded um, live. So then my process is where I take the strings and I take the brass, my MIDI data, and it gets converted uh, to dots on a page. So um, I then tidy it all up. We send it to an orchestrator who then is uh, in charge of the music prep and, and getting it all the, all the dots printed out. Um, to then be recorded uh, wherever it may be, Abbey Road or in Prague um, or in Budapest. Then at that point, all of that um, raw audio will get sent along with the other elements that I've added in, if I've got any synths or if I've got any weird sound effects or percussion that we haven't recorded live, I will send those as well. They get sent to a guy called Greg Townley who's just a wizard uh, and can make everything sound absolutely brilliant. Then it will get sent off to be mastered and then we have the final product. Uh, product. So there's quite a few stages that we go through and so yeah it's, it's all very nice that the composers get all the recognition but I do feel that actually it's all of these people that work behind the scenes that make the track sound as good as it does. Uh, so I hope that answers a bit of your question anyway. There's a lot of thought that goes into um, what albums are going to be coming out and released at what point before anyone has written anything. So there is a plan um, and then Audio Machine reach out to various composers saying like we've got an idea for this album, uh, we're going to try a few directions like this, would you be up for maybe doing four or five tracks or you know more um, and so it's very much, uh, we've, we've got the direction before we've even started. Um, what's really great about Audio Machine is that they uh, often reach out to us for ideas as well. That have you got any, any ideas for an album that we could do for this, that and the other? And actually earlier on this year we all met up uh, in London. They came and stayed for a few days in London and we all got together, loads of us, uh, and, and really talked about the future releases um, and, and what's going to be coming out. So it's very exciting. There's a lot of stuff on the horizon. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. There are so many ways of becoming a composer, there's not sort of any one right or wrong way um, and so the only way that I feel that I can answer this is to tell you how I ha happen to become a composer and for me the crucial part was when I told myself uh, I'm going to do this properly, I'm going to make it a full-time job. I made that commitment to myself um, and it's, it's understandably very, very difficult at first when you are an unknown composer. Uh, you've got money worries to think about, you've got to think about how to pay the bills, you can't just suddenly drop everything and write music because you won't have 
any income. So the first thing I did, I used to teach in a school and I wanted to become a, a producer and a, and a composer more and more uh, and found that my time, I, I didn't have the time to do it. I was trying to do a little bit on weekends and the evenings and it's just not enough. It's really not enough time to dedicate to it. Um, and I knew that I had to do it full time. So my goal was to drop a day's teaching a year and fill that day with uh, composing work. Uh, and then, you know, in five years, I would be a full-time composer. Uh, and it worked. Actually, uh, it, it, it worked far quicker than that. And inevitably, I sort of gave up three days. And by then, I was doing, you know, three days a week, uh, a week composing. And it just, I ended up dropping the next two very, very quickly. It was a big thing for me to get that, that structure in place and psychologically telling yourself that you're in it for the long run um, that you're, you're doing it properly get a proper business plan you don't have to write it down but map it out in your head and find the direction in which you want to go and work out at each level how it is that you're going to get to your next step um, and and treat it as a day job i come in here nine to five every single day regardless if i've got tight deadlines or if i've not really got an awful lot on and I write music every single day um, and I think it's that kind of dedication that will um, really be crucial into uh, creating a successful career as a composer, hopefully. Really simple answer to that is yes, of course. Um, I often think of um, scenes in a film or um, trailers that have, you know, been released of other of other films um, when I'm writing, and I will often uh, on my big screen here, I will drag up some um, some visuals from films while I'm writing to a to sort of give me that inspiration. And I'm quite a, I'm a bit of a film goer, so uh, that kind of visual um, impact uh, while whilst I'm writing is, I feel really, really helps um, me to, to, to write uh, that sort of uh, cinematic music, um, certainly. So yeah, actually it's a good question. I do that very frequently. For me, well, it's, you know what, this is the same as I'm, I'm sure most composers out there, but it is going from that stage of unknown entity, someone who hasn't done a gig, to doing your first gig. I think once once you've got over that initial hurdle of getting your first job, then then you know things not necessarily they don't start to snowball, but certainly you've you've got at least a, a, a selling tool that you can use to get other work. But it is that horrible stage, that first stage of I, I haven't done any jobs, I haven't written any music that's been used um, and, and trying to get that first job. And what it requires really is for someone to take a risk uh, and, to, and, to, and to take a punt and go with it. Um, and eventually I'm so sure that if you just keep pushing and persevering, someone will come along and go, do you know what, yeah, we'll, we'll use you. Um, and that's all it takes and then, and then you can start your journey but yeah for me uh, as I say as for everyone I think that's the, 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 the hardest part of, of your career is to get started there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them um, and I have got uh, app, uh, hard drives full uh, of, of different sample libraries so what I will uh, Give you a quick run through very very quickly of, of ones that i have in my template ones that i use all the time so strings um hollywood strings they're still my go-to they're a bit old now but actually do you know what they are my go-to um and then i will tend to use the cinematic uh studio strings as well which are often sound great um and then the los angeles scoring strings sound brilliant um so i tend to blend quite a few um different different strings uh, and then brass, Hollywood brass and um, uh, cine samples, the cine brass, I, I blend those two um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, woodwinds, uh, Berlin, uh, the, the orchestral tools Berlin woodwinds are phenomenal. I, I can't think of any other woodwind libraries that, that sound quite as magical as they do. So those are my go-to, those stay in my, in my template. And then percussion. I, uh, more percussion libraries than I can than I would have thought was possible, um, but I guess my go-to percussion uh, libraries would be 
Uh, Strike Force is brand new. It's just it's come out very recently. It's instantly gone onto my uh, into my uh, template. Um, other ones I use again the the East West the uh, Storm Drum series are phenomenal. They sound really really good. Um, and what else? There are oh, just there's too many. There's too many to choose from. Uh, Decimator Drums is a fantastic library from Audio Imperia. That always sounds good. And uh, choirs, I tend to go for um, the uh, any choir by 8DO is brilliant and also performance samples have come out with a fantastic choir library called um, Oceana which is just the easiest to play library, um, choir library uh, out there really. So uh, yeah, there we go, those are my sample highlights. Okay, so I'd like to finish off this Q&A with uh, a question from Cassie um, from the start and she was asking if there's going to be any more collaborations with Audio Machine in the future um, and the answer is very much so, yes, we've been working so hard this year in creating loads and loads of tracks and there's going to be a lot of releases uh, next year um, so it's all uh, very exciting, we've got, I can't talk too much about uh, the albums that we've got coming out but they're all very different we've got a whole range of, of, of albums coming out um, from you know the start of next year so keep your eyes peeled uh, it's going to be very exciting okay thank you so much for joining me uh, for this Q&A and thank you so much for uh, writing in with your questions and your your wonderful comments it's been really uh, lovely for me to actually read through uh, some of those lovely comments so uh, thank you again uh, please uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter for my sort of five or six tweets a year uh, at Harry Lightfoot and follow Audio Machine at Audio Machine uh, for uh, latest news and album release dates etc uh, yeah okay until next time bye